it's great to see how that stuff works. I mean, we, we have folks say, hey, gee, I just want 20 things. I'll go into the freezer and grab them. It'll be so much faster. But I, I, hope the, I hope the impression you're left with there is you have to be really careful or you pollute your stocks. People have taken copies of the library and used them that way. Postdocs can go in and get stuff. It's way, it is way faster if you just go in there and grab your scrape uh, bacteria for 10 things or something. But then the stocks are contaminated. They've been freeze-thawed multiple times. They go bad. It just the quality control does not uh, persist. So having all these processes in place, and uh, uh, Nancy leading a lot of them, uh, has, has let us consistently put out reagents with, um, with good quality control and good consistency. And in the viral production, for example, too, anybody can produce this virus. It's not that hard. You use our protocol, you'll, you'll get virus. But to get really consistent viral titers across a 96-well plate, there's some art to that. So that's something we've worked very hard at. So um, we found that making those processes production style, sort of thinking in a more you know, industrial manufacturing type frame of mind to get those consistent has been well worth the time and, and comes up with better biological results. So for the, for the next section, I want to describe more of the nuts and bolts of developing your screen. Um, this is going to be very overlapping with the discussion that uh, John led earlier, but we'll look at some specific examples and some specific aspects of screens that you have to take into account. And this goes back to the thing that I mentioned at the beginning where we don't have a protocol for doing a successful um, functional genomic screen because there's each one is tailored to the biology. Um, but we found case studies to be a useful way to think about the kind of factors that come into play and how you might handle them in your particular screening situation in the future. All right. To begin with, as we described, there's two um, different types of screening modes that we typically do a RAID where every reagent's being tested individually, pooled where they're all grouped together. Um, the issues around design, optimizing and executing a screen are a little different between the two. Some of the issues are different. A lot of them are the same. I'm going to start out with a, going through a RAID screening issues, and then I'm going to touch on some things that are more particular to the pooled screening case. In Either way, some of the main aspects of setting up a screen are similar. You not gotta, you've got to set up your model system and get that working well. You need to optimize the conditions for introducing your SHR RNAs or ORFs. At the end, you're going to read out the, the result. The cells died, they lived, they expressed their reporter. There's a translocation to the nucleus of some protein or something like that. In between introducing the shRNAs and that input, either the cells will be propagated in some cul culture conditions over time, or maybe you're going to do something to them. So this is setting up the initial model. This is what you have to do to preserve, to capture your biology over time right up to the endpoint. All the rest of this talk is going to be about trying to get those things right and what you have to do. All right, so first of all, typical timeline for an arrayed screen. Let's just take, let's say all you're doing is seeding some cells, and we'll call that day zero, though that's the start point. Okay? It's usually the next day after cell seeding that you introduce the shRNAs or ORS with lentivirus. About a day after that, you usually introduce a selection, as John described this before, use pyramycin or blastocyte to select only for the infected cells. You don't necessarily have to do that. Sometimes we don't. Usually we do. And then somewhere, Usually, almost always by day eight, you need to read out your input, uh, your, your output, your endpoint. Why by day eight? Because, as we said, if you're in microtiter plates, you can't pass it yourself. So there are occasionally have cells that don't proliferate very much. They can last longer than eight days, but usually they, uh, by eight days, they're, they become confluent and you're running into problems. So then you have to set the conditions in, in between. All right, so just to flesh this out a little bit more, what are the kinds of variables? Uh, that you have to consider for each of these steps. So when you set up the model, when you seed the cells, how many cells are you going to put in the well? What's the starting uh, seeding density? What culture conditions are you going to use? And there are more sophisticated models where there's other things to consider. We've, 
we've screened in situations where you seed the cells and then you do something to them, you differentiate them or you do something to them after seeding. Okay, infection conditions. There are a lot of variables in infection conditions. I'm gonna go through a bunch of those, so I won't say more about that. Um, the timeline, treatments you might do to the cells after you put in the libraries. Uh, you might make some media changes. Passaging, probably not in a multi-well plate, but with suspension cells you could. And then the endpoint measurements. Depends a lot on the endpoint measurement, so I won't get into a lot of details there. But if you're making a reading on an instrument, all those settings might matter. Um, the protocols you use, the reagents that you use. The big theme that I, that I want you to walk away with is that actually a lot of these details can really matter. They look like details. I mean, it's the kind of thing you read off a protocol. And in a lot of bench experiments, they're fairly robust to some of these details. You will, you know, you'll get the right answer even if some of these uh, uh, variables are changed a little bit. This, these are quantitative experiments. And changing one of these variables can change the hit list that you get in the end, change the gene list a fair amount. So they're really worth your attention um, as you develop the screen. All right, I just went through, I just ex gave you a few examples of the kind of things you want to optimize. There's a lot of variables, okay? How can you optimize so many variables? And more problematic is that the variables can depend on each other. If your screen's going to go longer, maybe you need to seed fewer cells so they don't overgrow. So you've got to kind of co-optimize all these different variables. And just looking at the infection conditions, you could leave the virus on for four hours or overnight. You could use many different seeding densities of the cells, range of viral doses, spin or no spin of the cells, different amounts of polybrain and so forth. There's other variables too. You multiply those out, that's a lot of conditions to test. So how do you do that in a reasonable amount of time and uh, not let that get out of hand? So this is one of the things that we do in the platform is to try and give advice about the order about which to, to, to go about this, to optimize these variables, to, to make it efficient, to get to a good uh, screening, um, uh, to get to good optimized screening conditions. Um, without having to test everything. So here's the way it tip typically works, typical series of experiments. It's customized, but usually first you pick out some seeding conditions, some setup of your model. It doesn't have to be perfect yet, but close. And the first step of that you might know, is to pick which cells you're going to use, or you're going to carry into the screen development. We've talked about this a little bit. You're going to want to test your biology in more than one cell line eventually. We strongly advise people to take more than one model into assay development. That makes sense to do because you're going to need more than one model eventually anyway for your follow-up. And because some of them might not work that well. As you begin to do the assay development, you don't want to spend a long time trying to develop your assay on a certain cell type and find out kind of late in the game that it's not working very well and you wish you'd used a different one. So it's good to try this on a few different cell types. Then just pick a few seeding densities that would fit with your, the general outline of how you're going to do this screen. The point here is just that a lot of these variables will feed back on each other. So you'll, you'll get a solution for some of these answers that's close. And then you'll go work on another part of this and go back and, uh, and re-optimize later. Okay, so there's sort of feedback here to, as you optimize this, these different parts of the process. All right, so we've talked about setting up the model. Let's go to this next step here, introducing the SHRNAs and ORFs. Um, the first part of that is actually, it's not about the infection itself per se, it's about measuring the infection. It's the selection conditions. And you use, even if you're not gonna use selection in your screen, you'll use selection to find out how efficiently you've infected the cells for assay development purposes. So you have to come up with this, these selection conditions at least for assay development, if not for your screen itself. You can do that without infecting with the virus. You just want to make sure that you kill the uninfected cells. Okay? So actually, this plot shows different amounts of virus added, different amounts of puramycin added to kill uninfected cells. This, this bottom line is the only one you really need. No virus at all. You want to use the least amount of puramycin you need to kill the cells that are not infected. You don't want to use any more than that because it could only cause trouble and you don't need it. 
you could confirm that that pyromycin's working well for you with some viral infection and just make sure the cells survive there. But to determine the amount that you want to use and the timing that you want to use for your selection, you can just make sure you're killing your uninfected cells with the least amount you need. All right. So now you can identify the infected cells with selection. All right. So now it's time to optimize the viral infection conditions. And what's your goal here? You want a high infection, right? All right. But you don't want to use far, far more virus than you need to achieve complete infection because, as was raised earlier, the viral supernatants that we're using right out of viral production at high quantities, eventually they'll cause trouble. There'll, there'll be some kind of toxicity in the cell. Some cells are more temperamental about adding in that virus than others are, so you don't want to use more than you need. But, so the goal is to get high efficiency infection in most of your wells. There's a number of different variables that affect this. The amount of virus you add is the most obvious one. The amount of time you leave the virus in for is another. Um, you can add polybreen. Polybreen's a cation. It just lets the virus interact with the cells more easily. Cells have negative charge on the outside. The viruses do too. So a cation lets them come together. The cell seeding density affects viral infection a lot. You, so I already said you'll make a few choices there and you'll, you'll check that out. Um, and then you can centrifuge the cells at low spin for a short amount of time. And that, that sometimes helps a lot too. All right, that's a lot of, a lot of variables in play here. Um, turns out some of them you have to do on whole plates worth of cells because you either spin the plate or you don't spin the plate, right? You can't spin half the plate and not spin the other half. But some of these conditions we've worked out ahead of time some matrix, matrices of these different parameters that you can, that you can um, use to test a whole bunch of conditions. And you don't have to work that out all for, for yourself and it, it, it saves a, a lot of time. So for example, left side of the plate, no selection, right side with selection, then you can have increasing polybreen uh, concentration, increasing virus volume on each side of the plate. I'm not sure, actually, I, I think we use something close to that. And then we use a 384 well plate where each quadrant's a different cell seeding density. Okay, so on a relatively concentrated small number of plates, you can test a whole bunch of uh, combinations. So what are you looking for when you test these combinations? You know, so what's your readout to decide whether these, um, whether you like spin or no spin or a certain amount of polybreen? You're really after a statistical answer. These are quantitative experiments. At the end, you're going to get a number for each perturbation, each reagent on your phenotype. Okay? So it's not just the average infection that you want, it's the whole distribution that matters and you, want, and you want to get statistics on this, you want to make a statistical assessment. So for example, here's a cell type that this is the distribution, uh, this is the percentage of the wells that are infected at different levels. 50% of the cells in the well inf infected, 100% of the cells in the well infected. So if you don't spin, the average well got 75% infection, some got only 50. With spinning, the average is up to maybe 90% uh, infection. And you do have some wells that are less well uh, infected, but most of those even have 60% infection. So that's the type of assessment you're doing. OK, so once you think you have a set of conditions you like, what sort of, what's the readout that you can use using selection to figure out across a bunch of wells, across multiple plates, how well did, that, did those inf infection conditions work. Okay, so what we do is look at the cell viability with and without selection and compare them. If you got as many cells after selection as you did before, you have high infection rates. So what we tend to do is to, to monitor this is to plot the cell viability in each well, each point's a well, um, and a treatment um, with sele uh, without selection. Okay, so you have a nice tight distribution of viability here when there's no selection. And with selection, okay, the diagonal is if all the cells are infected, they'll all survive. But if a, well's if, a, if a well has a lot of cells that are not infected, they'll do fine with the selection. They'll, they'll die. With selection, you'll fall below the line. So here's a case of a assay that was not well, an infection set of infection conditions that were not well optimized, and these things are far below the diagonal. After some optimization, these wells are coming up to the diagonal, and you have most of your wells reasonably well infected. 
here's a good result ready to screen. This was the, these were the conditions that were used for an ORF screen. So now you can see these guys are really right along the diagonal. There's a bunch of wells down here that grew fine without selection and completely died, or nearly so, without. Most of those are control wells. They were wells we didn't put virus in, so those are good to see. There's a few here that were supposed to have virus in them. That's the production failures in virus. So we know that you're going to have low viral titers in some small percentage of the wells. If you don't see that, you might start to wonder. OK. So now we've got the model set up, or at least we have a couple trial cell seeding densities that are roughly right. You got the infection conditions. Now you got to model sort of the rest of the timeline. Okay? And often the endpoint measurement is co-optimized with sort of your timeline and the way you treat the cells. You're, you're always making that endpoint measurement to figure out if you've got this right. Okay? So here are some examples. Um, this is an example of optimizing a rescue screen where the setup is you have cells uh, sensitive to a chemotherapeutic. They don't proliferate under, with treatment of the chemotherapeutic. And you're looking for the phenotype of rescue, of resistance to the drug. Okay? So with respect to this model post-library introduction, you have to figure out how long are you going to wait before you treat the cells? How long are you going to wait after you treat the cells with the chemotherapeutic? And how much, what's the dose you're going to use of the drug? So here's the chemotherapeutic was added at a fixed time. And then you wait for either 48 or 96 hours afterwards. Okay? And the, the screener had the lucky circumstance of having a positive control to look at. So they could see, in a particular case, if there was a, if, uh, there was a rescue, a good rescue, and monitor the size of the rescue by that positive control. And what you can see is the unrescued control cells okay, are dying with drug treatment. They, they need a 125 nanomolar concentration until you get good killing, and it gets a little better after that. And the rescue is apparent after that. You want this line to be as long as possible in general. Okay, so 96 hours looks better than 48. Okay, looks like maybe you need something like a uh, quarter micromolar, 250 nanomolar. Okay, so now you think you know the timeline, the drug dose. Will it work? Is the screen good enough? What else do you need to know? So I'm going to ask you, what else? This looks best, right? These are the, the positive control. This is mimicking what you think a hit will look like. Is very far away from the background wells, unrescued wells. So that's good. What else do you need to know if the, to know if the screen's going to work. I'll give you a hint. These are averages. Yeah, how variable is it? Because this looks like a nice big difference on this plot, but if the viability in these wells under the treatment of the chemotherapeutic is this plus or minus this, and the rescue is this plus or minus this, you're going to have a hard time distinguishing hits from non-hits unless you do them in, you know, 100 replicates or something like that. So you want to know if that's tight. So you can look at that. This is actually one of these, I think, is the same <laughs> circumstance. One's not. So the screener wanted to try two different drugs, Sim similar biology, but two different drugs. These are, each column here is a plate. And these box and whiskers plots give you the distribution of viability across that plate. So the shoulders here are 25 and 75th percentile, okay? And this gives you the med median and the mean, or the dot and the line. Um, and I think this is 90th and uh, 10th and 90th percentile, something like that. All right, so plate by plate. These are control cases where there's no drug treatment at all. So these are kind of positive control, but they're not really a rescue. You didn't even put the insult on there. These cells have gotten the drug. It's good, they're down a lot, they're tight. This other drug, this is one drug you want to use, this is another drug. This other drug's not killing very well. It's not as big a window there. This is the most stress you could ever conceivably get is back up to like you didn't treat with the drug at all. There's not as much room there. So a priori, you're a little bit more worried. These stars turn out to be on plate. There were some positive controls. Now that's really starting to paint the picture, okay? 
you're well above the 75th percentile with this drug. You're not above the 90th, though. Here, you're right at about the 70th percentile. That means 25% of everything on a plate is going to be look like a hit, look as good as your positive control anyway. Okay, Is that good enough? Well, it kind of depends. And this is worth thinking about. And, and if you have, I'd be happy to discuss what you would do at this point. But it really depends on how you feel about this positive control. If you think that there's probably a lot of other genes out there that can do as much or more than that positive control, you might still stay in the hunt. But if you think this positive control is about as good as it's ever going to get, you never want to do this screen because a quarter of your supposed hits are going to be garbage. This one you might, this one you might still do. But th this one you would do if you thought there were maybe some other genes lurking out there that could do as much as this one, and you'd feel pretty good that you could find them. But if you thought it's pretty unlikely anything's going to be as good as that, well, maybe you don't have a screen. Does that, any, uh, any questions or comments on that? Because you know, this is a really important part of things, deciding whether you've got a screen yet or not. Is this going to work? Do I keep going? Because at this point, you, you know, if this was the only thing we were going to look at, the smart thing would be to do would be to pick a new, pick a new uh, yeah, strategy. I'll, I'll just add that you know, as someone who interacts with a lot of people at this point in the stage of the game, you know, it's very it's, you're more managing emotions than anything else. I mean, that's kind of true throughout the screen, but you know, it, it, you want to move forward, right? You've been, you've been doing assay optimization for two months. You don't have any data. You're tired of talking to your PI about what you're going to do. You want to have your list. Uh, but if you rush too quickly to get your list, when another week or two of assay optimization would have made a difference, uh, it's the difference between spending two years in follow-up versus a couple of months. So uh, a, a lot of it is, again, managing your emotions uh, about, OK, am I actually ready to, to start the screen? And again, the, a bad outcome is that you give up here. You've sunk some time into it, and you, and you abandon the screen, and you lose that time. A much worse outcome is that you keep trying to do this screen, spend another year on it, and come out with just as little. So knowing when to change strategies or pick something else is, is key. All right, I'm not going to talk much about optimizing the readout or the endpoint, because it's so particular to the readout. There's so many ways you can do imaging and even gene expression. There's this L1000. Uh, now reporter assays, and they all have different considerations. I'm not going to get into the uh, details of them, but uh, the same kind of things apply to what I just showed you um, in just a viability outcome based on a drug treatment. Something else to look at. Arrayed screens can have artifacts. Um, pooled screens can have artifacts too, but of a different sort. Arrayed screens can have artifacts based on which pipette tips Went, went into which wells, and the order things were done in, and whether you're on the edge of the plate or the middle of the plate, um, where they were sitting in the incubator, things like that. Okay, So this is spatial effects on the plate. This is an example. All these wells should have had the same outcome. They supposedly had the same treatment. But you can see there's a lot lower signal around the periphery of this plate than in the middle. Shouldn't have been that way. That something you didn't, you know, that's, that's, that's something wrong with keeping uniform conditions. And in fact, often what you need to do for this kind of edge effects is to optimize the seating density some more, worry about your incubation conditions, don't stack the plates up, make sure that they're thermally equivalent. Um, media conditions, having enough media and changing it perhaps if you really have this bad, there's a few things you can do here. So this is before fiddling with some of these things, this is after you made it go away. And the, the bottom line is just to point out that this is a very strong effect that you can see, even if the effect's subtle. All right, so here it is a little redder on the periphery of the plate, but it, you have to squint to see it. That might not matter. If your hits are big, big changes compared to that, maybe you can live with it. But maybe they're not. So you have to be on the lookout. How big are these effects compared to the, what you're looking for? So this is the same thing, but on the plate by plate level, not spatial patterns within a plate, but patterns between plates. So here are some different batches of plates. This is the same kind of plot in alter miniature. I don't know if you can see that, but 
the only thing you have to get from there is these green things are the box and whiskers kind of plot. So you can see this batch has a different baseline than this batch. This is higher. Maybe it, you, you might need to normalize these separately. There's something else going on in this batch. This whole part of the batch is higher than that part. Happened right after this plate that was super high because these were all done in order. You got to look at this kind of stuff because if you just treat all these plates as equivalent without looking at this kind of thing, all your hits may come from that plate <laughs> or these guys or something like that. So, and we have some software tools to help you monitor those kind of problems. All right, so you've looked for your, you've optimized your conditions, you think you've got them all right, you've looked for spatial effects and artifacts and things like that. Now you gotta run some plates, a pilot version of this, and assess, is this generally working okay? There's a couple, there's a lot of things to look for to make sure your screen's okay, but here's two of the key ones. One is just replicate reproducibility. S run the same thing twice. You need to have a result that's consistent compared to the size of the effects you're looking for. Again, you know, you, 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 could, you, you have to, your replicates can't be more variable than the size of hits. And the other thing to look at is if you're, if you're lucky enough to have positive controls, you can make sure you can look at your positive controls here in black, your negative controls in red, peppered around, and a bunch of library wells, um, and see how they distribute. Make sure that you've got a nice separation there and that you'll see real hits if they crop up. All right, so that's, that's the arrayed screening. And then I'm going to touch on some of the issues that are more particular to, to pooled screens. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah. That's an excellent point and just the right kind of thinking. So the question was, do you have to worry about whether you, you're going to have variability in the virus? Uh, what do you need to do to make sure that that's not affecting your readout in the end? And in fact, that's one of a number of things that we explicitly check. So I talked about optimizing the amount of virus for high infection. But every variable that we sort of control there, or everything that we don't have under perfect control, like the amount of virus that's being delivered, because it differs well to well, we look explicitly what happens if we titrate the amount of virus, what happens to the readout? If the readout's hypersensitive to the amount of virus you added, you're in big trouble. You gotta think, look for some conditions where that's not true. If it's not so sensitive, then probably in good shape to just use the library as is. Pardon? Every time the virus is made, it may be different. So if you're optimizing this batch, then you can Another excellent point. And so that's why the early assay development might be done with various batches of virus, but the last stage of uh, assay development, at least, is always done with virus drawn from the same set that you're going to screen with. It's for exactly that reason. Okay, pooled screening. And I'll do as many examples as I think we have time for, make sure to get to our other topics as well. So John's already described something about the pooled screens. I know some of you have actually in the room have done this, and then others of you might not be familiar with it. We talked about why to do pooled screening. You don't have to use robotics. You can screen lots of SHRNAs for the cost, same cost of fewer arrayed. And you can, do anything, you can do lots of different things with the culture conditions. And it's good to keep in mind what the experiment looks like and some of these things I'll tell you about in terms of what you have to, the things you have to be careful about in designing your screen. So you take pooled virus, viruses that carry many, many different shRNAs, drop them on a big population of cells. Now every cell's carrying one shRNA, but they're all different in your batch of cells, okay? And then you're gonna, fun, you're gonna end up with two batches of cells. Now what those two batches, where they come from, can vary. It could be an early time point and a late time point. It could be with and without a drug treatment. But in the end, what you're going to do is compare and see if there are hairpins that are enriched for one samples that got one set of treatments versus another. I think I've heard you say this before, but how do you know that only one virus gets to one cell? Ah, so you do that with the infection conditions, and not sure how much I get into this in the next slides, but 
you infect with an amount of virus where only half of the cells will be infected at all. And the, it's sort of a random Poisson kind of distribution of how many viruses go into, so, how many into each cell. So if only half the cells are being infected, very, very few of them get more than one. And then you select, and now they all have one. All right, same thing as array screening. There's a lot of variables. A lot of them might matter for the outcome, so you really got to pay attention to them. Many of them are the same, except for in this phase of the screen, you've got bulk tissue culture conditions, not this multi-well plate kind of thing. And the phenotypes that you're, the, the readouts that you're using are restricted to the things that you can do with a pooled screen. And I'll describe what those are. So we touched on this already. A key with pooled screens is you have to be able to separate out a population of cells that are enriched or depleted in hit hairpins or ORFs versus another batch of the cells. So there's a few ways to do this. One is just in vitro proliferation. If the phenotype is effect on proliferation, then the lethal hairpins will just get depleted over time. So early time point versus late time point will show you enrichment or will show you depletion of the hairpins that have that activity. Pro-proliferation, the reverse or rescue from a drug, those guys will out-proliferate the ones that don't rescue. Okay. The most versatile way of separating out hit cells is to have some kind of faxable, um, fax sortable um, marker on your hit cells or your non-hit cells. So the, the fax bins distinguish hits from non-hits. Okay. As far as I know, this is kind of a unique example. <laughs> there might be other cute examples like this, but there's some circumstances where the cells will sort themselves. The hits, the hits will physically separate themselves from the other, from the other cells. So the migration is the phenotype. The hits will crawl through a membrane for you. <laughs> you can collect the things on one side of the membrane that are enriched for hits, and you take everything that didn't make it through. Those are non-hits. And here I'm mentioning, as John said before, you can do all this stuff in vivo. In vivo is not another way of separating hit cells. It's just pointing out that you can do all these types of readouts, at least in principle, for, for in vivo experiments. So there's this process of deconvolution in pooled screens that you don't have for RAID. For RAID, you know the treatment you think you put in every well. So when you get a readout, you know what to attribute it to. With the pool, you get a mix of cells um, that, all, that are enriched for hits, but um, all have different hairpins. How do you find out what hairpins were in there? You PCR out the hairpins as a barcode with SHRNAs or use an explicit barcode in the ORF library. So you've got to isolate those cells, pull out the genomic DNA, and then PCR out the hairpin or the ORF barcode. Um, then this is sort of the practicalities of just being able to cheaply deconvolute. You, you label different samples and you combine them all together. That's because of the nature of next generation sequencing, where you get this huge number of reads on one sample. So what you want to do, be able to do is put 20 samples into that lane. If you have 20 times more reads than you need, you don't want to burn them all on one sample. Okay, so you multiplex the samples and you throw them into Illumina and you sequence. We used to do this with a custom microarray that was designed to detect the shRNAs. Um, and that worked, but this works better. So in sequencing, so this is what we do all of them now. All right, this is probably the key consideration in pooled screens that doesn't exist in arrayed screens. It's the need to get the right representation for each of the shRNAs, each of the perturbations, okay? It's the analogy in arrayed screens to how many cells you had in each well, but that's usually just dictated to what fits in the well over the course of the assay. In the pooled screen, you need a lot, lot of examples of each shRNA or each ORF um, because you need a statistical answer of whether that, that shRNA or ORF is, is enriched or depleted in the population. You know, if you go from one cell down to none, what's that mean? That could, that could be easily random chance. And also, some shRNAs start out with few, fewer than others, so you'll lose all those very quickly if you don't have enough cells. We use at least 200 cells per shRNA. That's bare minimum. Um, I, we like to use more like 500 or 1,000 if you can come up with enough if, if you're not cell limited. And the notion here, this is the way, 
this is both the reason you need a lot of cells, and it's a reason to worry about bottlenecks. So you need to keep that representation of many cells per shRNA all the way through the experiment. If anywhere in your experiment you go down to fewer cells, when you weren't intending to select for anything, you are selecting. You're selecting out a subset of the cells, just like you were selecting hits, but you're not selecting it on the basis of the criteria that the screen was all about. That's what we call bottlenecks. So what happens there is what, what, what you're doing in general, I know you can't see the little, I had a little Gaussian here. So the non-hit shRNAs have a distribution of hairpin abundance that looks like this. The hits are going to be like this. You're always trying to distinguish the hit distribution from the tail of hairpins that just happen to get lucky. They happen to ride in cells that look like hits, even though they weren't. So a few hairpins will just happen to be in a lot of those cells just by chance. So you're always fighting to find the real, the things that are really shifted versus just the tail of the background. And a bottleneck anywhere just broadens this out. Yeah, so for a fixed number of cells that you could screen, let's say you're getting your cells, their primary cells out of a mouse. Um, if you screen fewer hairpins, you can use more cells per hairpin, and you'll get a better assessment. Um, if you're culturing cells that proliferate very well, we tend to just encourage people to culture more cells. Just use, use more cells. But yeah, if, if there's a limit to how many cells you could do, you could always use a smaller pool, get a better answer. And that's, John alluded to that for an in vivo case. When you're in the mouse, there's only so many cells that are going to do whatever you want in the mouse. So you, you are restricted there. You can't do a big pool. All right, I have a, a few examples of pooled screens where, like I said, I think case studies is a good way to see the kinds of issues that arise. Because they're always different for every screen. But you start to get themes of the types of things to look out for. Okay. I may not go through all of these in the interest of time, but I'll shoot to end up at about 1.30. Yeah. yeah, and Dave, I'm going to actually hit on number two a little bit in okay. my part, so if you want to skip that one for sure, I'll cover it later. Okay, good, good. All right. So the first one of these, the, the uh, postdoc here was interested in um, host gene, again, restriction factors like the like the example I showed you at the very beginning, but particular for pox viruses. Okay, so she was using a model similar to the one I described before, where the virus carries a reporter. You can see if the cells are infected. All right, and so she could look for, she could monitor cells to see whether they're infected or not. Uninfected cells. This is in facts. Okay, so she wants to do a pooled screen around this. So the uninfected cells have low reporter intensity here, and the infected cells have high, uh, high reporter intensity. Okay, so that's what she got first. She okay for a screen here? Big trouble, <laughs> big, big trouble. Her screen was to try and actually look for, actually, um, factors essential for viral infection. So she wanted to start out with highly infected cells and see which knockdowns would give her um, uninfected cells, would block infection, OK? This big tail is going to kill her, OK? You've got a lot of cells that look like hits that got the virus. Um, she could have given up here um, because this tail is so bad. She doesn't have good separation. Maybe she needs another screen. Fortunately, she thought about a technical issue that she thought might be going on, and she went to the trouble to try and work it out, and it paid off for her. She was worried, out, worried that these, these cells were really infected in this tail, but they were leaking out the reporter. Okay, so she had a virus that carried the reporter as a separate gene, so that was getting made in the cell, but it was leaking out of the cell. When she fused the reporter to a viral protein to anchor it in the cell, she got this kind of separation. Now, her background looks like this. Her hits are going to look like that. If she puts a fax gate in between, she's going to be able to identify uninfected cells, and they're going to be real hits. All right, so uninfected 
the uninfected case. Low signal, everything's down here. Infected cells, here's fax plot and the histogram, everything's up here. Not much of a tail, really good, good answer. Same thing here with a different control. This is just two different control shRNAs introduced. So it's inf it cells infected with the library and then with the, then with the virus. And then she has a possibility of seeing whether the screen's likely to work ahead of time or not before she goes to the cost and time of deconvoluting the screen and see which hairpins are operant. She can just see, does a lot of stuff, if I put the library in there, instead of just control hairpins, do I get uninfected cells? Yes, she does. Now she's got a bunch of stuff in there. So there's going to be stuff to look at. And then she can take that out and sequence it and see which hairpins were causing this to happen. So she's in the histogram, you got all these uninfected cells down here. Now, you know, would you set the fax gate here, for example, and take all the dim cells that are uninfected down there? Where would you put it? Way over here. Yeah, that's where they put it. They, there's no point, you've got plenty of cells down here that are very, very dim. If you get up here, you're gonna start getting some of this tail, even some of this little tail, all right? And there's no reason to. You've got plenty of cells there. So you take those that have very low background rate. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add again the sort of cultural aspect of screening. People often come into it worrying, I won't get any hits, so I'm going to try to collect a lot of stuff so I, I, at least I find something. Uh, that rarely happens. Usually you end up with too many hits, so you want to be as stringent as possible at the outset uh, so you really get what you're screening for and not just noise. <laughs> yeah, there are generally a lot more hazards of coming up with junk than there are of coming up with nothing. It's the, just restating what John just, just said there. So, just a side point, because the same screen has this along the way. This was done in four replicates, okay? And here are the hit cells, so the library, you did the library treatment. If you hadn't put the library in, all the cells would have been up here, infected with the pox virus. You put the library in, and certain hairpins push you down here. And you look at this in the four replicates. These numbers aren't coming out here, but you can see it down here. Pool number three, has 220 things, 220,000 things instead of 20,000 things down here. The hit rate, the perfraction of things that are down here is vastly higher than those other replicates. So that replicate was isolated. Why is this hit rate so much higher in this replicate? We don't know. But it could be for a bad reason. Could be, uh, could be a lot of those are false. Could be that the pox virus infection was really poor in this replicate. That's I would guess one of the more obvious possibilities. And then you wouldn't want to look at this very much. So this was an equal number of, you only took an equal number of hits here, not all the hits here to guard against that. Okay, I'm gonna skip through this. John's gonna cover, um, gonna talk about this next example. So I'm gonna pass through it. And then this, Third example is uh, really just to point out that there's all kinds of variations you can do on, this fat, on these pooled screens. So here's a case, it's a lot like the other ones I showed you, except it's a two color fax screen. So you're just sorting for hit cells based on two uh, signals. In this case, um, the uh, postdocs stained for adult and for fetal hemoglobin. And he was interested in shRNAs that would drive you to a high ratio of adult versus fetal or a small ratio of adult versus fetal. And that's more selective than just looking at the level, say, of fetal hemoglobin or adult hemoglobin. He's getting more information out of just one screen. Not all screens are facts-based screens as a proliferation screen. We've talked about rescue screens already, so I'll just suffice it to say here, this is a rescue screen in pooled format. You treat a bunch of set, a pool of cells with a chemotherapeutic agent that kills them generally, and you look for um, shRNAs that cause the cells to survive. You're just looking for survivors at a late time point versus the hairpins that were present at an early time point. And those are the hairpins that convert a survival advantage 
against the chemotherapeutic. All right, so just a few take-home lessons from this. In a pooled screen, you need a very low background of hit cells. Okay? You need a circumstance where you don't have a lot of cells spontaneously looking like hits, because you're gonna, they're, they'll be mixed in with your hits, and they'll all have hairpins in them, and they'll make those hairpins look like hits. You need to avoid a bottleneck in the, in the cell numbers, otherwise it gets harder to distinguish the true hits from the background. Um, If you have a positive control, it's great. You know what your hit should look like. But even if you don't have a positive control, you can see if introducing the library increases the number of cells that fit the hit criteria. And that's a sign that it's worth proceeding and sequencing that batch of cells and reading out the outcome of the screen. So you can, for half the money, you can sort of get a preview as to whether there's a good answer lurking in your, in your experiment. Um, if the screen's not saturating, if you, haven't put in, if you don't get that many cells harvested out in the end, the replicates not, might not agree with each other. Not because of false positives or wrong answers, but because you don't find all the answers in every replicate. So there's some cases where we've relaxed replicate reproducibility, and I think we have some signs that that made sense in those cases where you know you have a reason for why that is, but you have to be careful. You could do pulled screens on primary cells, but you have to get enough of them, you have to make sure they behave well enough. And then we just went over some of these lessons of facts-based screens, so I, I think I won't reiterate those explicitly here. All right, so this is the end of this section. Just going back to the, the main point is really in these screens, there are a lot of variables, a lot that you are aware of and thinking about, and a whole bunch more that are hidden. Uh, in just exactly what happens over those five days or eight days or 25 days in a pooled screen. And you gotta be very careful. Some, many of those variables, some of those variables won't change the answer very much, but m many of them may. So you really have to um, beat on your screening system a lot before you execute your primary screen and create a hit list that you're going to use for the next year, two years, to build some great stories. <laughs>